the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, CCLA, will be speaking today. Uh, Cara uh, Zubel, sorry, uh, the director, and Alain Bartelman, the uh, conseiller spécial aux affaires autochtones de l'association. He is a special advisor to uh, the association. And then we'll go on question fr first from the room and then on Zoom on that. Cara. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kara Zwiebel, and I am a lawyer and program director at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. I am one of the lawyers that will be representing the CCLA before the Public Order Emergency Commission. Uh, with me is my colleague Alain Bartleman, who is CCLA's special advisor on Indigenous issues. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to him uh, to introduce himself and, and do a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Kara. Merci, Kara. Good morning, my name is uh, Alain Bartman. I'm a special advisor uh, for the uh, Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Uh, we will recognize that uh, we are on the unceded territory in Ottawa uh, of the Algonquin communities. Uh, they have been here for Immemorial times, and we recognize that uh, the Algonquin people are the uh, 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 guardians of the uh, basin in the Ottawa. We have a long history of uh, um, welcoming tradition in this uh, territory, and uh, Aboriginal title land of the Algonquin Nation, whose presence here. Uh, goes back to time immemorial. We recognize the Algonquins as the customary keepers of the Ottawa Valley Rivershed. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations uh, to this area. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow, the public hearings of the Public Order Emergency Commission begin. The Commission will be scrutinizing the events leading up to, including, and following the federal government's decision to declare a public order emergency in February of this year. I want to be clear about the CCLA's position. The protests needed to be addressed, but the government also had an obligation to comply with the law and use emergency powers as a truly last resort. That was not the case, and it is our opinion that their actions were unlawful and unconstitutional. We are going into the Commission with an open mind, but in our view, the government has yet to prove that the legal threshold to invoke the Act was met, and the burden is on them, not the other way around. This is what we will be focusing on at the Commission, the federal government's decision to invoke the Act, and the constitutionality of the emergency orders that it put in place. As a participant in the inquiry with full standing, we will vigorously test the government's evidence and demand that the government is held to account for its actions. We believe that the inquiry must address several important questions, including first and foremost, was the legal threshold for invoking the act met? Were there genuine concerns about threats to national security, or was the government largely concerned about the economic impacts of the blockades? What evidence supported the government's view that there was a threat to security or a serious threat to the lives, health, or safety of Canadians? Why, according to the government, were existing laws inadequate to address the emergency? What alternatives did the government consider? Could legislation passed on an expedited basis have avoided the invocation of the act? Why were the emergency orders drafted so broadly when the protests were localized, why was application to the entire country considered necessary? How did the protests and blockades impact the rights and freedoms of people in Canada? And perhaps more significantly, how did the emergency orders that were put in place impact the rights and freedoms of people in Canada? When the Emergencies Act was first proposed as a bill, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association advocated for meaningful oversight and accountability mechanisms to ensure that the gross violations of civil liberties that had taken place under the War Measures Act would not be repeated. The Commission of Inquiry is an important accountability mechanism and the CCLA is looking forward to helping to ensure that it is a meaningful one. 
The inquiry will also provide the broader Canadian public with the opportunity to gain a greater understanding of the events that took place and come to their own conclusions about some of the issues at play. Uh, my colleague Alain will um, give our statement in French and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Kara. I will uh, give you a brief overview of the kind of process we are involved in, uh, the, the CLC position, and uh, take note of the kind of uh, questions we'll have to answer tomorrow. Uh, the uh, hearings of the Commission will begin under the direction of uh, um, Judge uh, Paul Rouleau about uh, the events prior and following the decision of the federal government to declare an emergency state on February 14th of this year. This process will end with a final report to be published in February 2023. As my colleague uh, indicated, the issue is not whether to know uh, the protests that took place in Ottawa and in Coutts, Alberta, in January and February had to be uh, set, uh, tackled. Uh, we knew that uh, we had to re-establish order. It is based on the uh, Emergency uh, Act and uh, it has to be, uh, and this law has to be uh, implemented by the federal government to face uh, different emergency situations that are uh, such, uh, of such proportion or nature as to exceed the capacity of our democratic process. The resort to its power necessitates a uh, reasonable base so that uh, we can uh, settle any matter threatening uh, the safety in Canada and such that it is a national emergency. Um, it, it has to be demonstrated that uh, lives and uh, safety of uh, Canadians uh, have been seriously endangered and that uh, provinces do not have the measures to face this kind of measures. The federal government had to use uh, this act in la as a last resort, and that was not the case. And we uh, think that uh, federal government decision was unconstitutional. The decision to invoke the law and the constitutionality, the declarations of emergency, um, and uh, as full participants in the inquiry, we will vigorously test the evidence provided by uh, the uh, government and hold uh, the government to account. We believe the CDA should address several important issues. First, has the legal threshold for interpreting the act been met? What have the issues? Were there real concerns about threat to the national security? Or was the government was concerned with the economic impact of the blockages? Was what evidence supported the government's view that there was a threat to security or serious threat to the life, health or safety of Canadians? Why does the government think the existing laws were inadequate to respond to the emergency? What alternatives has the government considered? Could an emergency law have um, avoided invocation of the act? And why were emergency orders written so broadly? Why was a nationwide application deemed unnecessary? How have protests uh, blockades were affected the right when it was implemented for the first time uh, as a legislation. Uh, the CCLA has called for strong oversight to ensure that gross violation of civil liberties that occurred under the War Measures Act do not occur. The Commission's inquiry is an important accountability mechanism, and uh, uh, we are Pleased and looking forward to contribute to making it important. The inquiry also provides the Canadian public with opportunity to better understand the events that took place and to draw the, their own conclusions. I look forward to your questions.
We'll go to the questions, first in the room and then on Zoom. Nous allons euh, maintenant prendre des questions, premièrement dans la... We'll first take the questions in the room and then we'll go to Zoom. Do not hesitate to use the function. Raise hands. Uh, Stuart Benson from the Hill Times. Hi there. Um, you said that it, it, you didn't believe that the Emergencies Act was used as a measure of last resort. Uh, and or that it could have been dealt with sort of uh, expedited legislation. Are there any specific examples that you can think of that the government could have used instead? Because I think some of the problem was even if there were existing laws, the police seemed unable or didn't have the resources to enforce those laws. So uh, just are there any examples you have of what they could have done? Well, I think, I think it's an interesting question um, about the resources because I think um But, you know, as as I'm as I'm reading through the the documents that have been produced and um, and looking at at some of the evidence that I think will come out over the course of the commission, um, it it seems like the the resources that were requested by the Ottawa Police Service in particular um, sort of finally came through right around the same time as um, as the act was invoked. So I think there's a question there about whether um, you know which which had more impact. Um, but, but if you think about, you know, um, situations where the government is in a very um, difficult situation, like um, like a, a labor strike, for example, of, of um, you know, essential workers, um, there have been instances where the government has gone to Parliament and passed legislation very quickly to get those people back to work. Um, now, that's not something we would want to see happen on a regular basis. Um, but, but I think there is a, a question here about why... Um, If, if we did need new laws, um, why couldn't we pass those laws rather than use uh, an emergency measure which places all of the control in the hands of the executive and, and takes it out of the control of parliament? That, that's one of the questions I think we think needs to be answered. Follow up? Yeah. Um, and just with the legislation uh, part, uh, do you think that that would have been possible considering this sort of... Uh, I guess the atmosphere in the House of Commons at the time when you had uh, some conservative uh, MPs that were at the very least uh, not uh, against or opposed to the protesters. Do you think they would have been able to have gotten that through? I, I guess I, I would expect that, you know, um, sort of emergency legislation, as it were, would probably garner the same level of support that the, the proclamation um, did. So I, I think it probably could have passed. There was, you know, I think there was support for that, but. Mylène Crête, La Presse, question. Mylène Crête, from The Press. Oui, um, yes. uh, I'll ask my questions in English, if you don't mind. I was wondering, we had some of the answers to your questions during uh, the parliamentary committee, so why Are these uh, answers unsatisfying? Uh, for instance, they in, uh, invoke the blockades in other areas of the country, includes Alberta, Emerson, Manitoba, to say that it had to apply to the whole country. So why is it not sufficient in your eyes? So I mean, the 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 blockade in in Coots was um, dismantled before the emergency um, was invoked, um, and it's not to say that. Uh, You know, when we say that it didn't have to apply to the whole country, that doesn't necessarily mean it, it could only apply to one place. It, it could apply to more than one. Um, but, you know, it, it applied to uh, to the territories where, as far as we know, there was nothing happening. Um, you know, uh, it applied to the Maritimes that had a couple of, um, I think, of, of early, you know, convoys, but but nothing on the level that we saw in, in Ottawa. Um, and, you know, I think one of the... Uh, really significant things that we're concerned about was um, the, the breadth of those emergency orders and how that breadth was communicated to the public. Uh, because I think there was, um, I think the government may have um, used the confusion that the breadth of those orders engendered to their benefit. So I think that there was a, um, I think Canadians weren't sure, you know, if I'm donating money, are my assets going to be freezed? That's something was that, that Canadians were unsure about. And I don't think the government um, took much time to really clarify that because I think the goal was to prevent people from, they, they wanted to stop people from donating. They wanted to stop people from contributing to these causes. Um, they wanted to stop people from, from protesting. 
um, even protesting that didn't interfere in the way that, um, that many of the Ottawa protests did. Um, so so I, I think that those are you know, some things that we want to hear more um, from some of the government witnesses about. Police resources, I, I recall um, the acting police chief saying on numerous occasions that they did need the Emergency Measures Act in order to have that many, was it 1,800 police officers? <laughs> like hundreds of police officers coming to Ottawa in order to um, uh, deal with the, the protests. So what do you think of that? So, um, so I guess I, you know, I'll, I'll need to hear more from, from those witnesses when they testify at the public hearings. But I, I think that um, certainly over the course of you know, the, the weeks that led up to the invocation of the act, um, they, they were, you know, um, they were getting officers from all over the country. They were, uh, there are memorandums of understanding with other police forces so that they could come um, and, and execute their, their duties here in Ottawa. Um, I don't think that there's anything that was required um, from the act to make that happen. Next up, Mary K. Walsh, Globe and Mail. Hi there. Um, just, uh, I have many questions, but first of all, the, um, what, what you were answering uh, first the Hill Times about other legislation, I mean, the Emergencies Act is the legislation that's there. Why would they create legislation to duplicate it so like, can you just specify more sure. why that matters and what the distinction is? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the, the federal government uh, declared a state of emergency using the Emergencies Act, and then the executive branch passes these executive orders that mm -hmm. are the things that say you can't gather, that um, financial institutions have obligations to freeze assets of people who are um, designated individuals. Um, those are the things that um, the government could have done by way of legislation that would have benefited from parliamentary scrutiny in advance rather than uh, after the fact. So, But what is the difference between parliament voting to invoke it and the scrutiny that comes with that versus having these new laws on an expedited manner in which they might skip over the committee process anyways? I don't understand the distinction. Well, the distinction is that, it, that, that you, have the, you have parliament weighing in before the measures are in place instead of after the fact. So by the time Parliament approved the, the state of emergency. Um, those orders were already in place. They were already operational. Um, and so, and I think also what I was, what I was mentioning before about, about some of the confusion around the scope of the orders, that's also something that might have been addressed had there been debate in Parliament in advance. Okay. And then I just wanted to get your sense on um, the commission generally. Are you satisfied that the the witnesses that are listed and the setup of the commission is actually going to get to the heart of the question as to whether the government met the threshold because we're not hearing from the provinces, we're not hearing from Doug Ford, for example. Um, you know, the accountability for policing is with the municipality and the province, and the federal government had to step in because it fell apart at those levels. So are you satisfied that we will actually get the answers you're looking for? So, I don't know yet. Um, you know, I think we have to see. Um, we have to see what happens during the course of the public hearings. I mean, we are hearing from municipalities that were affected. We are hearing from uh, witnesses from from Ottawa, the Ottawa Police Service, the Ottawa um, Police Services Board, members of council. Um, I, I think, you know, I think there's also questions around. Um, what will be held back, and that's one of the things that I don't have a good handle on yet. I, I know what documents are have been put forward, but I don't know what documents have been held back or uh, the reasons for that, and those are some of the things that I think will be explored over the course of the hearing. So I, I think we will have questions about whether the government is being forthcoming enough, whether the evidence is is going to allow the kind of transparency that we think is required. Um, and I can say that already, um, I mean, the, the timeline that the commission is working under is is set out in the statute, so they are stuck with it. They are stuck with having to, you know, uh, put a final report before Parliament in February of 2023. 
that's a very short timeline, especially given the fact that the, the government waited almost the full 60 days that they had to actually name the commissioner. So um, that's two months that were lost that could have been used to, to start gathering evidence. Um, and I think that, you know, they have a very ambitious schedule, the commission. There's a lot of witnesses they want to hear from. There are a lot of documents to get through. Um, there's also a whole policy phase. So I, I think it's, it's still to be decided. And one of the things that, you know, that may come out of this process are recommendations about amendments to the Act around this process in particular. Um, do we need more time for an inquiry? Do we need specific specifics in the legislation that would address whether the government can hold things back from the commission or whether you know everything everything needs to be provided david fraser kidden press hi uh, just following up on uh, my colleague's question there regarding transparency how confident are you in the government's commitment to transparency are you concerned at all the the government will try to shield evidence um from being made public by having it uh, presented in camera just to the commissioner and can you comment uh on how your confidence level in the government's ability to be trans, uh, transparent has been uh, impacted, if it has been impacted at all, by CCLA's um, ongoing judicial challenges um, taking place now as well. Thanks. Yeah, so, so I do have concerns about um, the, the level of transparency that the federal government um, you know, has, has been displaying through, throughout this process when uh, we are also um, We've also sought judicial review of the decision to invoke the act. And, and so there's been discussions about documents and about cabinet confidentiality in that context. Um, you know, and it's not that we don't recognize that there's a sphere of activities that the government rightfully can, can protect. Um, you know, but, but one of the things that the Emergencies Act requires is an explanation that gets put before parliament about why, um, you know, why the act was, why it was necessary to declare an emergency. Um, for me, that document is the government's answer. Um, and, and if they start to say, well, there are other things, but we can't share them, or there are other things that, that are, we're not at liberty to, to disclose publicly, you know, I think that's a problem in terms of, of not being forthright with parliament um, and not being forthcoming with the Canadian public. Just as a follow up, outside of what the government actions at um, the judicial review level, has there been, any, been anything specific to the commission process that has, um, I don't know, carried forward your concerns a little bit more or, or made you think those concerns more? Um, I think it's uh, probably still too soon to tell. Um, you know, certainly um, I, I was anxious to get access to a, a documentary database um, long before it was made available to me. Um, but, but I appreciate that the individuals that are working on the commission are, are also dealing with, you know, with a huge challenge in terms of, of all of the material that needs to be uh, reviewed and, um, and also the back and forth that they're, that they're engaged with with the parties that have that evidence. So um, I think it's a huge undertaking. But um, like I said, we, we are going into this with an open mind. We want to hear from, from the witnesses. Um, I think the commission, I have every reason to believe that the, the commission process will be a robust one. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot will depend on, on how forthcoming the witnesses that appear are. Thank you. I believe that's it for the questions in the room, unless you want a question, Damien. That's, that's it. So we'll go to uh, Zoom. I'll remind uh, every reporter on the line to uh, use the raise hand function at this point. So I'll hand you the mic. First up, uh, Alex Balingo, uh, Toronto Star. Hey, thank you so much. Just kind of bouncing off uh, what uh, you know, the, the questions of uh, your confidence in, in the transparency. Um, the government. Uh, had said that they would they would hand over a lot of cabinet confidences. I think that the, the the quote was all documentary inputs that went into their decision would be given to the inquiry. Um, can you tell us about whether you feel that what given what you've seen in the documentary evidence that that is something that they've actually fulfilled, and whether those those inputs will be will be public so that the public can scrutinize all of those. So I think at this stage, I, I probably can't do that, partly because I've just not managed to get through looking at everything that the government has has put forward to the commission. Um, and I think that even what I, what I have access to at this point is probably not the full scope of what will be put forward. Um, 
and I think some of it will, will also have to come from questioning witnesses about, you know, we only know what, what's there, we don't know what's missing. Um, so we'll have to ask some of those questions. I, I think, um, I think also there's, uh, there are, you know, there, there are questions in my mind about, you know, whether what was provided to the commission is what is going to be provided to, uh, to all the parties to the commission and to the public more generally. I do know that any document that is put to a witness or that is raised during the course of the public hearings um, should be going up on the commission's website um, within a, a day or two of that document being put forward. So I think these documents will will get, you know, public the light of, uh, they'll be put before the public, um, but I don't know yet whether it's, um, whether it's sufficient. And, and just on your, your concerns about the emergency orders and, um, you know, the, the open question, I guess, about whether they respected people's rights and freedoms, I wonder if you can just get more specific about which orders and how uh, they may have violated the people's freedoms. Sure. So there, I mean, there were two emergency orders that were put in place, and I, I'm not going to remember the, the, you know, one is, I think, just sort of called the emergency regulation, and another one is the economic measures uh, regulation. Um, the, the emergency regulation um, restricted public gatherings, restricted, you know, public assemblies. It, it did say that um, they were only restricted if they were likely to give rise to a breach of the peace um, or, or language similar to that. Um, again, the, the problem with that kind of language, especially given what was going on uh, in Ottawa, is that I think people who genuinely were interested in engaging in peaceful acts of protest um, would, would have real concerns about whether they would just be lumped in with other individuals who might have been involved in illegal activities. So, um, so there's a, a scope sort of question about that order. The, the other order that deals with financial, um, the, the financial or the economic measures, um, basically, you know, charged financial institutions, all financial, all financial institutions across the country to freeze the assets of, of anyone um, that they thought were involved in breaches of the first order. So, um, and, and again, there's, there's some vagueness in these orders and how they were communicated to the public. And I think even, um, and I think this evidence will come out over the course of the inquiry. Um, I think even the financial institutions themselves weren't exactly sure what they were supposed to be doing. Um, we know that there were names given by the RCMP to financial institutions, um, but in addition to those names, the order itself laid out an underlying obligation for the financial institutions to do their due diligence and um, and take measures against anyone they they believed were were implicated. So um, that's where we got the confusion from members of the public about you know are my assets going to be frozen if I made a small donation or um, what's the scope of this. Um, so I think those are things again that we'll we'll learn more about over the course of the. Um, over the course of the inquiry, but when it comes to how those impacted the rights of Canadians, um, you know, first of all, there's privacy issues in terms of uh, law enforcement and financial institutions sharing information. There's no due process with this, not even notice, really. Um, there wasn't a notice requirement, um, so the financial institutions didn't have to advise you that your assets had been frozen. Uh, so th those are, you know, significant um, Deviations, I guess, from the norm uh, that exists in our in our democratic society, um, and those are things that we want to, to to question and probe during the course of the inquiry. Thank you. Next question, Fraser Needham from APTN. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just the fact, I guess, that this current uh, act exists is because the War Measures Act had to be refined, right? So they. This is the first test of it. Um, with so many questions arising, as you know, that's kind of why we're here, uh, of whether, um, you know, it's not even clear that anyone that was in Ottawa, that the, the police here were actively trying to stop the protest before, um, you know, sort of the large weekend that, that led up to it being stopped. So, and there was, as far as I can remember, there's no uh, declaration that by the Ottawa mayor that needed, you know, the government, federal government to step in. Uh, and there was no um, declaration. I 
don't think by the Premier of Ontario that the federal government needs to step in as well. So is this, are you thinking that regardless of what happens here, is that this act is going to have to be amended because of, uh, there's so many questions now around it? Um, I, I don't know if I'd say that it, that it would have to be. I, I think the experience that we've had should inform, um, you know, potential amendments. And, and like I said, I mean, it, this is more on the procedural level than the substantive one, but just this question of uh, how long does an inquiry have to look at the questions that, that came out of declaring an emergency um, and what kind of transparency measures are required from the federal government when they do declare an emergency. I think those are things that could be usefully addressed by amendments. So um, I would imagine that there will be recommendations coming out um, of the inquiry that will, that will address possible amendments to the act. Yeah, I guess just to follow up on that, I, I, are you um, foreseeing a lot of questions of uh, provincial, uh, you know, federal municipal jurisdiction? Uh, because, again, there's, uh, you know, it didn't actually happen on Parliament Hill. It happened in the city of Ottawa municipality, right? And it's sort of their area. And then the, the, the municipality is sort of a creature of the province. And this is a situation where the, you know, Parliament just stepped in. Uh, do, do you think those, those kind of issues will come up? I do. I mean, I think there, this is, it's made more complicated by the fact that we are, are in a, you know, a federal country and that, um, uh, that municipalities are involved and, and even that, you know, the way that police oversight and governance is done varies um, across the country from place to place a little bit. So I, I think there are um, difficult questions about how to manage um, something like this where, where you have different jurisdictions with different authorities um, engaged. Thank you. I don't see any more hands on Zoom, so if... Uh, all right, Thank Marika. you. Um, Mariko Walsh again with the Globe and Mail. I just wanted to go back to um, your arguments on why you believe the, go the government's invocation of the Act was illegal. Can you specify which elements of the threshold the government has not proven? Like, where are the question marks in sort of, you know, they have to explain the justification. So what, what are the missing pieces for you? So I, I think I, one has to do with this question of a threat to national security and, and what that means. Um, and, and this might go to broader questions about the way that threats to national security are defined under the, the CSIS Act, which is sort of the, the touchstone that the Emergencies Act relies on. Um, but you know, generally, we, we consider um, threats to national security to be things that would put people's lives at risk, um, uh, you know, serious acts of, of violence um, or, um, you know, genuine attempts to violently overthrow the government. Um, those are not thresholds that we think have been met, or at least we haven't seen the evidence that, that demonstrates that. The, the other thing I think is, it has to do with the adequacy of the existing laws. Um, and, and this might be, you know, a legal question, whether um, the, the way that the act is framed, it talks about um, there not being, you know, laws that can address it. And, and this goes to a question that someone else posed. Um, you know, does that mean um, that the laws don't exist or that they're not being applied and enforced? And, and how, do we, how do we work through um, those issues? So I think there's, there's uh, more information that we need about the the discussions that happened, um, particularly between the federal government and the province of Ontario um, about about the powers that the province had and, and could have used. Um, th those are some of the, the sort of threshold questions. Okay, and uh, just going back to your question around the documents, can you be more specific around uh, what documents you understand that you will be receiving or you have received and, and where are your question marks? What documents are there question marks around that, you, that either the government has already said it's not releasing um, or that it's unclear? I, I don't think I can answer that at this stage. I have, an, I have access currently to a, a large amount of documents. I have not been through them all. Um, I've also, as counsel before the inquiry, given an undertaking that I will not discuss those documents. Um, many of those documents will be put to witnesses and made public over the course of the, of the public hearings, but I don't know yet which ones. Um, and, and I don't know, I also don't know um, what, what was requested. So um, 
when I'm looking at the, the database of documents, um, I don't know what questions were asked by the commission to get these documents, which, which does make it a bit difficult to assess um, whether it's sort of complete and answers all the questions that we'd want. And can you clarify that, will you guys be cross-examining all witnesses or only some, and if so, who? So the, the parties have the opportunity to, to ask to cross-examine witnesses. Obviously, there's a lot of witnesses to get through. There's a lot of parties involved, um, and the commission has asked that you know people try to coordinate and cooperate so that um, so that things get get through um, in the time that we have. Um, I, we will not be cross-examining all witnesses, not by any stretch. Um, I expect we will we will cross-examine some, but a lot will depend on on how much gets covered because the the way it will work is that commission's counsel will question the witnesses first, um, and it may be that you know that all the questions that we have get answered over the course of that process. So we'll have to we'll have to see. Um, we'll, we'll get a little bit of notice about what the scope of their questions will cover uh, a few days in advance of each witness, and then we'll have an opportunity to decide whether we want to cross-examine. David, other questions? Hey, Dave Fraser again with the Canadian Press. Real quick, um, just, you mentioned their um, interest in learning more about the communications between the federal and, and provincial government. Were you surprised, or would you have liked to see Premier Ford on the, on the witness list? Um, So I have to I have to take another look because I know that there are some witnesses who are not appearing in person, but who who um, there are there are going to be um, sort of statements from those witnesses that will be introduced. I don't know if if um, Premier Ford is one of those. Um, it may be that that's sufficient. Um, I have to say the list of witnesses is is quite long, and I and you know and many of them are names without much context. So it's it's. Um, I assume there will be witnesses that we'll be hearing from at the provincial level, um, and we'll have to see whether those are the witnesses that have kind of the, the pertinent information that we need. Um, as the moderator, perhaps I'll just ask one question, uh, one last Boris Proulx devoir. Uh, if the commission finds that uh, it is not supported by evidence, that it, it was not justified from uh, at the first place, then what? What happens? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's done, right? What's done is done. Um, so. But, but I think that that's an important finding. I think that's an important finding for Canadians to, to know. I think it helps inform future governments about when, um, when this act can be used. Um, it might affect how, um, how people feel about the government. It might affect um, you know, decisions when it comes to election time. Um, so, so I think those are important questions to answer. But, you know, I mean, obviously, what happened in February is, is over now, so there's there's no sort of recourse to go back. But this is an important piece of the of the accountability that's um, that's really mandated by the act itself. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. That puts an end to this press conference. Merci beaucoup uh, aux deux panelists. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you all.